Unfortunately, we're not able to bring Econ 101 to Washington. But he's going to bring some here today. Uh, he's got a lot of great stuff to talk about as a high school economics teacher. He's taught countless students throughout the state about economics and free markets and individual li liberties. So without further ado, everyone, Kirk Bills. Thank you, Tim. Uh, and I thank Tim and all of you who did so much work and uh, made uh, me and my family so welcome when we went all across the state, whether we were in St. Cloud or Duluth or, or up towards Moorhead. And, and that means a lot when you're running and you have a young family. I have a wife, Cindy, who's, who's home with the kids right now. I'll be taking over this afternoon. But we have a 15-year-old, a 13-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 6-year-old. And we were able to do all this. And we're a working class family, too. Um, I never quit my job. I kept teaching even when I ran for the U.S. Senate. I taught my first hour class and uh, didn't want to leave the classroom. I didn't want to leave what I did. I didn't want to leave that, that thing that I do and the thing that I'm known for and that I do the best. And I, I wish someday uh, we get to a point where we have elected representation that doesn't forget where they're from. You go and you serve and, and you do your public service if you elect to. You join the military, you do what you do, and then you go back to what you did. And you be a citizen. And you find somebody who's willing to replace you and run and, and be principled as well. I was able to do that in my house seat. So before I get, get going uh, too much, the, the breaking the ice thing, this was just incredible. At first when it started out, I looked around the room and I thought, oh my goodness, this is going to take quite a while. But, but then as we went through, not only was it great to see Tim tweeting the best comments from everybody, uh, but also you get to know just how individual we are. And, and how, how possibly can a government replicate or regulate and try to beat the individual knowledge in this room, or the or this city, the state of Minnesota, this country, or the world. And, and it is absolutely fascinating to me that there are minds out there that believe that they can, that they can nudge us into the right behavior, the correct behavior, those behaviorally commons. And I would just encourage you again to, to keep doing that activity. That was that was incredible. Just to see where everybody comes from. My good Baraboo. Are you kidding me? I grew up in Sauk City. I, I grew up 20, 25 minutes south of you. And uh, it was just, Chris, so I look forward to, hopefully we'll get, get a chance to talk. One of my great friends is uh, down there at, at your uh, community college, uh, running the athletic department. And, and it's meeting people like that, and it's networking, and actually getting out, and, and I love what Tim said, it's not just about eating pizza and agreeing with each other. It's about getting out and actually becoming involved, and, and I'll get into that just a little bit too. But uh, just to give you a little bit about who I am, just in case we did have a little issue with name recognition uh, this last time around. So, so yeah, it was, it's tough. It's a big state. It's 87,000 square miles. But, but I grew up in South Central Wisconsin, and uh, when I came out of high school, grew up in a real blue-collar family. So we didn't have, I remember specifically the evening that uh, I was sitting at the dinner table, and my dad's a pipe fitter, and uh, I remember you know, my senior year, you know, hey, there's a lot of people, you know, looking at colleges and stuff, you know, and, and I just left that hang, and it, and it got quiet. And Dad set down his knife and fork, and he looked at me and he said, clearly you understand there's no money here. And I thought, okay, I'll go to work. So, so I, got out, I got out of high school, and I went to work. I, I uh, uh, did road construction. I was a laborer. I've actually, uh, one, one of the interesting things and, and why I thought we could get rolling and you know, get a little bit more money and get your message out there. I've been a union member since I was 18 years old. I was in the Labor's Local 464. I was in the Pipe Cover's Local 394. And now I'm a teacher, so you public teachers in the room, you understand that you either belong or you pay fair share. And they always work out the money break, the 85% to 15%, so it just makes economic sense that you stay in. And I'll tell you the reason why I stay in is because then I have a voice. And, and it's great that for them to hear my voice. I'm not, and I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid to bring my voice to those meetings and to that discussion. And then I, I get to have my say, too. And, I, and you know what I found? There's a heck of a lot more school teachers out there that are libertarian, Republican, conservative, or true independents. And if you give them a reason to, if you stand up, so don't ever be afraid of standing up. Don't sit down. I always tell my kids this in my class when I'm teaching seniors. You are, you know, it's almost like it's built into you. Just sit there. Just sit there and have it shoveled into you. And don't get up. Don't make a stand. That is the wrong choice. 
And that is the message that goes out to every class that goes through my room. You need to be able to stand up. You need to put yourself into a position to let people know how you feel. Because you know what? Even if you get booed, you get heckled, you go walk over into the alcoves, you go walk to go out the door, you know what happens? Every crowd I've ever been in, a few people come over. You know, I really like what you had to say. Even though you're in a bay, you're you're in a group that might not agree with you, you'll always find them. And and with today in, in today's world with the internet, love the comments about the internet blew my worldview. Love that comment. But in today's world, they'll find you. So so I encourage you to go out and be involved. So I got I, I went to work for a year and a half, made enough money to get to school, went to Winona State uh, to be a police officer. Uh, wound up looking at the education department. Thought it would be uh, great to catch the kids before they became criminals and uh, try to influence them. And also got into coaching, loved, uh, loved, loved sports, and uh, coached for many years. Uh, but went, up, uh, went out to Colorado for a couple years, came back here, also met my smoking hot Scandinavian wife at Winona State. So, uh, you know, thank God for Minnesota. Uh, no, no, hey, Wisconsin girls are great, not you know, great, beautiful Wisconsin girls, but, but I saw that blonde, that Norwegian, and it just went crazy. So, uh, so and we have four beautiful children, they're all blonde too, and uh, thank goodness, and they take after their mother. So I uh, met her, we, we live now in Rosemount, and that's where I've been teaching. When I got to Rosemount uh, 16, 17 years ago, uh, low man on the totem pole, so I'm gonna have to take, teach the class that nobody else wants, if you know how that works. And lo and behold, it was economics. And so I started teaching economics because I, I think the other teachers knew that there was some math component. And, and, uh, and I was okay with that. So I uh, so started teaching economics and, and absolutely fell in love. Uh, fell in love with the subject, became very passionate about, about it. Uh, very, very defensive of, of uh, how independent it should be. I don't want my curriculum locked into a, a cookie cutter mold. And I've stood up for that at our district meetings and, and at various uh, state curriculum meetings as well. Um, as, I, as I began teaching economics and, and uh, especially in the macro, and we learn about the national debt, the deficits, uh, uh, the way we treat our money, the way we handle our money. Uh, so many questions from young people. And out of the mouths of babes come these great, great basic questions. You know, they're not politically tinged at all. And, and in uh, 2007, 2008, it was, it was kind of coming to a head. And, and uh, kids just started to look at me and, and say, well, what do we do? What, what can we do? And that's why it's so great to see this organization kick up. Because y'all is going to, now I can help drive them to, to give them various examples, but y'all is one organization that I can actually help them find. And they can get involved and actually affect some change. So, uh, but back in 2007 and 2008, that, uh, this organization wasn't here. And I was amazed at how frustrated the young people were that it just didn't seem like there were solutions. And uh, so I decided to do two things. One, I decided to run for office instead of just ranting and raving uh, about the, the terrible things that policymakers do. I decided to get involved, so, so I ran for city council. Um, 26 people ran that year for two spots. It was a record setting year. And uh, so my wife allowed me $500 as, as, a, uh, as a budget. And, but, but teaching and coaching in a community means a lot, and uh, I always like to say it's, uh, parent-teacher conferences are kind of like door knocking in reverse. You know, they just, the parents come to you, and they get to know you, and you, you build up a name, some name recognition in your community, and, uh, and we were able to win. So I was able to win a spot on the city council and, and was uh, overjoyed, a lot, a lot of things went on, but one thing that, that one thing we started doing was actually paying down debt. We actually started to pay off debt instead of take on debt. And that's a tradition that has continued even since I've been on the city council. They've continued to pay down debt instead of take on new debt. Uh, so that's how you can affect change. I'm, I'm no longer there, but I was able to help uh, the people who got elected uh, to take over two spots and be involved with the mayor and help him out. And then he starts seeing things my way too. So that's how you can see that, that uh, how, how you can affect change. And then in 2010, um, I was asked to run for the, for the state legislature. And I was asked by the Republican Party, and uh, I was called by one of their members, and they said, well, you're a Republican, right? And my, I'll never forget my comment. I, I said, uh, well, I don't know if I'm a Republican or not. And he, he was very put off by that. Because I did caucus with them. And uh, 
But I, I was kind of like the lady in the back, the whole political party thing, just, just, you know, just from what I had seen in teaching economics, it was very difficult for me to make that choice and, and to actually put a tag on you and run. But I did, and I'm glad that I did because I was able to get elected to the state legislature and go into the state legislature and then learn more about, about the party structure as well. And that has helped me, uh, and also in two years run for the United States Senate. And, and what teacher could actually, you know, what, how, how blessed am I to have this experience and now go back every day and, and teach these young people and, and have, you know, 500 kids a year go through your class? And the, the amount of believability that you have when you've done these things, because clear, hey, you know, in that city council race, it would have been great, you know, to get beat then I could have just went back to my classroom and continued to complain. And that's probably what would have happened. And that would have been too bad. Because now we have a great opportunity. We have a great opportunity to affect the policies and the direction of this country. And it's going to be affected by a couple of things, and I'm sorry, I'm going to cut to my notes because I'm going to try to get you back on your, uh, get you back on track here for time too. And, and that's really where I see you guys come in is building the infrastructure that actually helps to win elections. And you can still back those candidates. I love the mission statement. Back those principled candidates. And do you know what you allow those candidates to do? You allow those candidates to stay principled. And you give them a reason to. Because if you send them, and they're there alone, I've seen this within the caucus structure, you know what happens to them. They're going to be uh, they're, they're going to be manipulated into, into taking certain votes because the party can get them reelected. Let me tell you something right now. You get them reelected. You be the boots on the ground that does that. And don't be afraid to do the work. Is it a lot of work? Absolutely, it's a lot of work. But does it pay off? Yes. Because I do believe that we're not gone yet. Another, another great comment from an individual. We have a lot of problems. We have a lot of financial problems. We're in a solvency crisis in this world. And I'm sure that Mr. Woods will come in here this afternoon and, and give a great discussion. And that's why I'm not going to be very academic in my discussion this morning. I'm going to be more about, hey, let's win some elections. Let's, let's make sure that we have a process put in place that when somebody steps forward who's just a regular, everyday person, that there are resources at their disposal that they can actually utilize and help get, get them elected. There were two, two big, there are many issues with, with running for the U.S. Senate, uh, things that I'd go back and, and, and do over again. I understand you're supposed to put in a ton of time and make sure that you, you dot all your I's and cross all your T's in terms of financial resources and lining people up who support you and everything. That, that's something that, that, you know, I was a short timer uh, in, the, in the House of Representatives and probably didn't put in that much time lining up that, the financial resources. But you know what? Money is very elastic. I want to say that again. Money is very elastic in politics. It can come flooding in. And then it can stay away. But it can come flooding in. And it'll come flooding in when you have a plan. When you can show people, I've talked to big donors around this state and around this country, and you know one group that they're very interested in? Is y'all. There are people who, who might be those, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't like to label people, but whether, you know, the, the traditional establishment Republicans or whatnot, but there, there are financial people with means who are watching, and they're very impressed with what you're doing. And if you can combine the financial resources with what you guys do, boots on the ground, it's going to be fairly unstoppable. Because at a young age, and, and keep that youth driven, and I'm glad that, you know, look around the room, and I'm glad that we move the goalposts a little bit in terms of, you know, young Americans for liberty. That's, that's good. But don't ever forget that, that, you know, keep that youth, keep that youth-centric idea. Okay, is that for future generations because that's what the donors are wanting to see and they like you guys and uh, so that's a little bit about one you know a little bit about little where a little bit where I'm going now too and that is to try to find the resources to bring into you guys to, to help you 
because data collection is the other thing. Money's elastic, and I, I, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to make the calls for money. You know, I don't know how many people have run for office. I think there's a couple of people in here who have. It's tough, isn't it? Making those calls for money, trying to get people to write out big checks, because it's a big state. And those are big Senate districts, and those are, <laughs> you'll, you'll never believe how big a house district. You think, oh, just that little house district in that state. And then go walk it. I wore out three pairs of shoes walking mine, talking to people. And, and money helps. Local cable ads, uh, getting out the direct mail, uh, that all helps. But money's the last. Data, data's everything. And that's where uh, our, our friends on the left or our progressives or the Democrats are, are beating our side right now. Is they get out and they mine for data. But that's where you guys come in. And I think if you get into a situation, and I've got to cut through a few of my points here, but uh, I think if you get into a situation where you find in, in this state, for instance, in Minnesota, you have 67 Senate districts, 134 House districts. You, you get out and you start building out your y'all organizations in every college, university, trade school, tech school, you name it, and anywhere else where young people gather. And I would also push you here, I would say you need to go out, and uh, I know I, I've talked to people at my high school about this, and we used to have a young Republican group, we still do, they, they don't they don't meet like they used to. Uh, Kate was a part of that, Kate Ang Angstrom from Mornet. Um, the Kate was awesome, I mean, when, when she was there, it was being driven hard. Um, but now and we have a Young Democrats group too. But get these organizations even down into high schools. You know, create the situation. I look out here and I see many people who are, who are you know, in their early 20s. Just think, you know, I'm 43. You're literally building the organization now that's gonna help somebody in this room run and be that principled person standing in, in whether it's the state house or, or, the, or the United States Capitol in Washington, D.C., to be the next Rand Paul. And I know Minnesota's a big, bad, blue state, isn't it? It's tough. We got that Scandinavian socialism thing going on. <laughs> now, I don't understand it. But I know that when you actually go out and talk to people, and you listen to people's concerns, and you're absolutely, absolutely right, debating a libertarian, they don't want to. Um, and, and when you take it another step, and you actually you know, you, you got to make sure to listen to them first. I, I have a great friend in uh, former Governor Al Quig. I don't see eye to eye with him on everything, and he knows it. He's 89 years old. And once again, do you know a group that he really likes? This group. He likes the Ron Paul people. He's not a, he's not a Ron Paul supporter. But just think what this man has seen. He came to my school, and he spoke to, he spoke to a room full of young people. You could have ever heard a pin drop because his first statement was, let me explain to you why my grandfather fought in the Civil War. His grandfather. And he, and he went on to discuss everything from, from Harry Truman to uh, George W. Bush because he has met them all. And what was a, what's amazing about him is he, is he likes the Ron Paul movement because of your individualism and your independence. So, when you think about that, think about the people that do like you. You know, because a lot of times, you know, we, we start to butt heads even with, with people within the, the Libertarians or the Republicans. But think about the chance of cohesion. You know, I, I think there's a great opportunity in this state to, to go from where we've been to where we can be in just two years. And you guys will be responsible for that. Not just in Minnesota, but look what Wisconsin has done. Amash is from what state? Michigan. Michigan. Look what's happening in the Midwest. Look at Iowa. Look at the movement you've had within your party. So there's a great opportunity there. and There's a great opportunity to listen to other people and then offer your solutions. So I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to get out of your high schools. Adopt those Senate districts. Adopt those House districts. Get the grassroots started from the ground up. Gather the data. The data is what's worth everything. And, and what I'm saying here is that you have people who are in office. What allows Rand Paul to be principal? Yes, he's a very, you don't think there's anybody else who's principal? There are. And they'll stay that way when they know what? That you're behind them. 
That's what gives somebody backbone. Is when they know that they can go out and they can charge into it. And, and then, you know what? And if you get beaten down, we're going to be right behind you coming, coming again. And we're going to be here all day long, every day, and twice on Sunday. And you will not make us sit down. You will not make us go into the shadows. You will not keep us in our own little groups. Not getting our ideas out there. And, and so that I would encourage you to keep doing that. Um, I, a couple of words of caution, though, too. Is, is uh, stay young, keep that youthful approach. And, and some of the things that I've seen, because because I, I put myself out there and, and certainly felt the get, getting ripped apart. It was almost like being a child in, in a in a bad marriage. Because in this state, you have the Ron Paul movement, you have the establishment Republicans, you have the neocons, you have you know you had all these different groups of people, and and some and to some degree, they really started to to tear at the, the fabric of, of our U.S. Senate run, you know, is that they wanted you to go different directions or they weren't going to support you because of this or they weren't going to support you because of that. All kinds of reasons for me to just go back to my classroom and, and again, once again, start to rant and rave about the machine and what it is and what it's not and how I would do things differently and isn't, isn't that great in room 201 or Rosemont High School. But what good does that do us? It doesn't. You cannot just stay within yourselves. You have to get out there. And one of the cautions with, with being, a, being older, I think I'm older, middle-aged, whatever, is uh, you got to be cautious of talk radio. Talk radio is wonderful. I turn it on. But one of, the, one of the things that I see is that it gives somebody who's working a job a chance to turn on the radio on the way home and mentally, or, or maybe even every once in a while, call in. And that's what you do. And now you're done. I did my part. I'm not going to walk. I'm not going to collect data. I'm not going to donate. Because you know what I do? I listen the hell out of that radio every day on the way home. That's what I do. <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. That's a trap that you can get into. And then you're not actually out there moving the football forward. So you got. I'm going to caution you about that. I'm going to caution you about the uh, the purity fire. I actually hung on for longer uh, supporting Ron Ball than his son did. But I got blasted when I said, "Okay, let's run forward and, and win." So, so you can have your purity fires if you want to, or you can move the football forward and help somebody get elected. Find a principal candidate. <laughs> Find a principal candidate and move forward. And I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you why that's so important. I'll just give you one example. So my wife Cindy's a, a licensed child care provider, and she watches 14 kids. I drove the the big, uh, the big white van here, big four, you know, big twelve passenger van, the daycare van. It's got, it's got ten car seats in it. She busts her tail, watches fourteen kids in our house every day. And now the state of Minnesota wants to force the unionization of those entrepreneurs, those small independent business owners who have their own business running it out of their home of which there are 11,000 of them, 8,000 of them can take the CCAP money, the subsidy, 4,000 of them do. So what the state of Minnesota is going to do, because 4,000 of 11,000 take state money, they're going to unionize all of them. So, and I know some of you might be thinking, what, where do you come, you know, why does this just come out of the blue? That's an example of what happens when you don't win elections. That's what happens. There is no Liberty Phoenix bird rising from the ashes when the government collapses. They take over my business. I already pay 85%, or I pay the full dues, so I pay 780 some dollars a year 
to an organization that endorsed Amy Klobuchar and didn't even interview me that I've paid dues to for 16 years. That's already a part of my life. But now what looks like is going to happen is now my wife can pay too. So now some third party entity, so study your Coase theorem, now some third party entity is going to have their hands not only in my pockets, but also in the pockets of my wife. Because we didn't win elections. That's what will happen if we don't win elections. We have to win elections and move the ball forward. So be, care be careful about pointing the guns inward, um, as, as a good friend of my mine likes to say. Be careful of pointing the guns inward. Because eventually it will be a progressive takeover of the whole system. Um, another thing. Ask how you can help. And, and that's what I'm engaged in right now. Is I ran for city council, I ran for the state legislature, I ran for the U.S. Senate. And now what I do is I find those people who stand on principle, have great ideas, and I ask how I can help. I, I lecture for a living. So it's nice to get out of my classroom where, where I don't know. I understand what, where they sit. I'll ask them questions about their policies and what their thoughts are. But what I've tried to do is I've tried to find some people who I can get behind and support and then support them with everything that I possibly can. And I think if we do that and focus on that, I think it's going to be a great thing um, in, instead of focusing on the negative. And then um, don't, don't also don't get addicted to your little government thing. That was my last piece of advice that I wrote down was don't get, a, don't get addicted to your little bit of government so that when the time comes where we do actually have to work on balancing a budget, when we have to, you know, whether it's the sequester or whatever, whatever, you know, reduce the size of the increase, it's just simply amazing. But, um, <laughs> but make sure that it's, it's not all of a sudden we say, well, you know what we've got to do? We've got to look at these subsidized loans for students. Hey, don't touch that. Same thing with, I went out to Farm Fest. And I told the farmers what I really thought about subsidies. And you know what? Nobody booed. They understand. There's some of them who really need it. But they understand where you're coming from if you just stand on principle and, and move forward. So, But if the farmers say no, can't end those subsidies. And the students say no. And the teachers, well, you don't want to. You're going to do what to education? Oh, boy. We're gonna have trouble, you know. So, so you, you be careful as you grow into adulthood that you don't get addicted to your little government thing. And then when when it comes time that hey, we do have to actually get this spending under control, that all of a sudden you, you're the one pushing back because oh, that that's my little thing that I like. So, so I, I caution to cautious you caution you about that. And uh, and just stay principled. You know, one other thing that I did when, when in 2008 when I had all those questions, and this is my last thought, and then I'd like to open it up and I'll answer any question, uh, any questions you might have in terms of the run and, and just my thoughts. But well, another thing I did was I started a, uh, a studying the schools of economic thought in my classroom. And we had done a little bit of this before, but I really took it, took it to another degree. So we start from, from the theologians in, uh, in 800, uh, 1100 AD, and we go all the way through the theologians, the, the physiocrats, the mercantilists, the classical school, uh, the, the Marxists, the neoclassical, the Keynesians, the Austrians, the supply siders, the monetarists. Uh, and then we study rational thought economics and we study public choice theory and, and we study behavioral economics. And, and that's been so wonderful to open up a discussion. Because if you want, if you want to see your students start to, to open their minds up, or the, or the people that you talk to, have an understanding, a great understanding, of what they believe too. I've read Das Kapital. I've read the Communist Manifesto. I've read the General Theory. You know, so we like to throw out Bastiat and Mises. I love them. That's where I am. But when you quote from Keynes, and then you explain why you don't believe in it, 
That is a very, very powerful thing, my friend. And, and when you teach kids about Keynesianism like you believe in it, and then you blast it apart, and then you teach, teach the Austrian school, and then you blast it apart, and you teach Marxism, and then you blast it apart, and then have them write a paper at the end of the trimester, which one do you think you believe in? Then they can open up their mind and start to see, see you know, you know, the world through different lenses instead of just that one lens. Plus, when I go to work on curriculum, it sure does help me out because I can tell the other teachers that, you know, we learn a lot about Keynes, but then we also learn a lot about Hyatt and Mises and Menger, <laughs> names that most teachers don't, don't necessarily even, even know. So um, that's my message for you today. I'm sorry I tried to jam it all up so that you could guys, guys uh, could get back on your schedule, but I sure would appreciate I can hand the microphone to somebody if you have any questions specifically about things that I went through or uh, just in general. So. getting into the Republican Party and making a lot of changes and getting some really good inroads. Is, is there a movement on the left? I mean, again, I started up you know, from the right and moved into this situation. But have you seen anybody coming in and trying to, to not really subvert, but get people you know, with liberty agendas in the Democratic Party so that when you actually have a choice for a candidate, whether right. it's left or right, you have somebody that supports the liberty movement? I, I think the, the greatest uh the greatest amount of work has been done with what you're talking about by the, I think it's Eric who run, I'm the, the Senate District 60, Eric, no, I got, bet I got the wrong name. The gentleman from Minneapolis. Dave. Dave, I'm so sorry, I was trying to remember so many names going around. But these gentlemen, and we should give him a round of applause. That's a, that, is, that is incredible what, what, what these ladies and gentlemen are doing within Minneapolis and St. Paul, and that's what they're doing, whether it's with the foreign policy angle, um, I sure wish we could finally uh, get on track with a good sound money angle that, that if you are really for the poor, then you want sound money. Uh, I mean, you should see the kids, when we go over my advanced placement kids and we talk, because they've been through U AP US history typically uh, with a very progressive teacher, and uh, they, the, you know, the cross the goal speech, when, when we actually, and I can quote that speech, but when we actually get into a discussion of sound money and how, this, how that was worked politically, um, they're amazed. So I think we need to do a, a, do a better job of messaging that we are truly the, the party of the working class and we're the party of, because hey, when, when you experience inflation in the economy and, and even how we measure inflation can be debated, but, but when, when you're experiencing that as a working class family, I mean, that's, that's, where, that's where the tire hits the tarmac. I mean, you're looking at, you're looking at our, our cost for the daycare, you're, you're looking at $120 to fill up the daycare van, like, you know, toilet, toilet paper, paper towels, you know, things like that. I mean, I'm seeing the things that cost every Minnesota family, and, and if we simply put it, we didn't have food stamps and all the subsidization that we do. Just imagine, uh, but we, we have bread lines today. So why are we not, why are we not messaging towards we're the, we're the party that truly wants to help? And I think that's a direction that we could move. So, but that's where I see it being done is in, is in, the, is in Minneapolis and St. Paul within Minnesota the best. They're actually, because that's where they know they have to win the voters. That's, that, those are the voters who are gonna come over and you have to be able to message. And that's why you have to have different candidates. It's not, we have to prove that we're not just a cookie cutter party, you know? I, I mean, that isn't our, you know, everybody prides himself on diversity on the left, you know, but look at how much more diverse the Republicans are becoming, even within the party. So I, I think it'd be great to have some pure, you know, the, the pure libertarian candidates who are running in Minneapolis St. Paul, that's the way to attract those votes from the left, so. And then somebody can keep track of time too, because I want to make sure you're on your on your schedule. I'm OCD, so. <laughs> I, I, I like the point that you made about uh, the endorsement of Robbie, and though it's a good strategic point, I'm wondering if now that the Liberty Movement has gained momentum, whether we have enough leverage or not to be more inclusive as a strategic point, to, uh, because of right now we we kind of want to space ourselves away from the old guard. So mm -hmm. do you think it'd be advantageous maybe not in this election cycle, but the next one? 
to be more inclusive and be more reticent about endorsing candidates that aren't liberty minded? Um, in, in terms of where my mind, and I'm, I get, I'm, I, I'm just a little old econ teacher, but my mind says that, uh, well, what the heck, our, our presidential nominee is going to be Rand Paul anyway. So. <laughs> on his part, so that's that's where I'm working. You know, I'm, I'm working as hard as I can already. I, I want I don't care what his thought is. I, I want Rand Paul to run for president in 2016 because that that helps us, you know. And uh, um, but where the variables go, uh, all I know is I can I can do a, a job within the state party, um, within the state party leadership, and try to. To, to influence that and, and show how much resources we have, uh, whether it's with groups like this or, or what have you, and what we can do uh, to help pull some of, pull some of the money that's being spent. If, if you go in and you track the money in the state of Minnesota, from a better Minnesota to the you know the line of Messingers, I mean they they have so much more in terms of financial resources than we do. So we have to become. Uh, very smart with, and you're going to hear from some people later about the minority, the Liberty uh, Alliance within the minority community and everything. We have to get in, and we have to go into populations where they are not used to us going, so that they have to spend money and resources to hang on there. And that's why we should not be afraid of, of uh, Minneapolis St. Paul. We should welcome it. Um, how, how it will affect the, the overall uh, president, you know, in four years, the, the presidential run, and can we be more inclusive? I, I think we're going to have to see where it comes down in terms of uh, uh, you know, whether it's Iowa or Minnesota or Wisconsin, where we sit in terms of leadership within the party and, and how, but still that said, we can still help. You know, so I'm in the, I'm in the Ron Paul, Rand Paul mode of, you know, I ran Republican and that's where I'm staying. I think we can, I think they have enough infrastructure, they have enough, you know, donors, they have enough, enough resources for us to actually affect some change that way. I, I completely understand and, and uh, I, li I like the Voltaire thing about, you know, I. I, I just with the libertarians who want to go off and be their own part. That's that's I understand, and I will defend their right to go do that. You know, just like Voltaire said. And, and but I, I sure do wish they they join in, and I think that we could really affect some change that way. I I, I think Rand Paul and, and Ron Paul have a have you know if it, if the Republican Party was good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So. Hi, Kurt. Uh, good Hi. to see you. Looking now, it's 2013. You're looking back at the election that just happened. There been a lot of conferences, conventions like this, and a lot of conventions were there for your convention, been all the way through campaigns. And you, as a candidate, know as well that there often kind of, uh, comes a time where there's friction, and it's a continual thing throughout a campaign. Continual friction between, on the one hand, using your candidacy as a way to educate voters. On the other hand, marketing yourself in a way to win their vote. And there comes a point of friction where it's like, okay, do I try to change their mind or do I, do I appeal to what they think now? Looking back at your campaign, the scale of, of a state campaign, what is that interplay? What, what, can, what kind of light can you shed on that? That interplay between the one hand, being a candidate, you gotta sell yourself, you right. gotta win the votes. But at the same time, being honest enough to actually change how people think over the course of time. Right, and, and I, and I you know, and you can have your own opinion, definitely. I, I felt like I stood up for what I believed in, and, and uh, they asked me after the convention, I remember standing right in front of the bus, they, the reporter said, uh, how will you change your message now in the in going ahead and heading into the general election? And I, I said, I won't. And they, they were really shocked by that. I, I don't feel like we did it all. Um, what we did do was, you know, we had, what, what we needed was about 450000 more dollars to get the commercials that we had canned about. Because we did, we had a great message. Even the, even the people on the left, you know, and I know folks who sit down with, with Democrats who are in the Klobuchar camp or the state party within the DFL, and, and they say about our campaign, holy cow, if you guys would have had the money. Um, you had a public school teacher, a lifelong union member, running for the right reasons because of the questions that his kids ask him. And simply put, what, what, I guess the, the trying to always find the positive, at least we know now that, we know how many votes you can nail down by just being the grassroots, get to every parade, knock on doors. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? I mean, at, at least you can take that away. But, but also on the other side, if you don't have the money to get on statewide TV, um, you know, I, I'd love it if every person was, was, was like all of us here and wanted to educate themselves. But again, anybody who, who studies public choice understands you know, ir you know, irrational behavior, you know, uh, rational ignorance. 
Um, it just doesn't make sense for me, you know, for the average voter to go out and, and, find, and do the work. So you have to come to them in terms of commercials. You have to do uh, the Google ads. Uh, you, have to, you have to get on uh, the internet wherever you can and find people. Uh, direct mail, I think direct mail should probably be used more than it is. Again, I wish we could have been able to, to use that, but, but we weren't able to. That just allow, and again, if you have the backbone of the principal, that's what allows you to stay principal, is the people behind you. And to hear from somebody, you know what, I really disagree with you on this. But give, here, give me some more of your lid, I'll go, I'll go door knock 300 more houses. That's what, now, now that, that, for a person who ran and a person who's been there, that influences me so much more than an email, you know, a scathing email about how dare you, how could you. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so that, that's, my, that's my thought. We have time for one more question. Yeah, just out of curiosity, how much backlash did you receive um, either from your own Republican Party, kind of the neocon, anything to that sort? And then also, did it ever affect anything in the school room with anybody who just personally disagreed with you and tried sure. to make something of it? Sure. Um, the, the, again, the, the backlash or the, you know, where I, where I felt it was, uh, and just being, I'm a completely, you're going to get 100% unfiltered, okay? Um, the donor community shut off because of the volatility that was going on. Um, with, so the great thing is the Ron Paul movement did such an awesome job of winning delegates and, and uh, controlling the, the state party stuff. The bad news was what happens in the newspaper can't be controlled. And you could de I could definitely see and I could definitely tell that that's what they wanted the story to be. And whether that was driven by political means, whether that's the other camp getting involved and saying, hey, we need to drive this story because that volatility within the Republican Party will make donors stay away, um, whether it's what was happening with the state party. So yeah, I felt, again, I felt like the kid who's, you know, got to choose between mom and dad. You know, mom and dad are fighting, 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 so now I've got to, uh, you know, oh, mom and dad, don't fight me. <laughs> Please just get along, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, um, and uh, so I felt, I felt backlash from both sides uh, at times. You know, there, there are great people on both sides as well, I don't want to generalize. Um, they're, they're mainstream establishment Republicans. I don't know if I'd call them neocons or not, but, but there were establishment Republicans who just, I asked them to help out financially, and they were like, who do I check out to? You know? and, and so they were there for support. Overwhelmingly, though, the, the big donors didn't show up. I don't know. I, from what I've seen, a lot of in-state Minnesota money went out-state uh, to try to help candidates in, in different areas around the country federally. Um, and then the other question was about in-school um, again, I, I, I kept teaching even when I was serving uh, in the state legislature. Uh, there, are, there are individuals who, who won't look at me, who, who don't say hi, very few. Um, but typically the people who preach tolerance and understanding <laughs> of all people. Um, and, and you know, I, just, I try to say, I still try to say hello. Um, but, but what I'm, what, again, what, the great thing about the, the, the public school, uh, being in the public school and, and uh, is that you'll get the, the, the 58, 60 year old special ed teacher who walks up to you in the hallway and she walks up and looks around and leans into you and goes, I'm so glad you're running. <laughs> you know, and, and, and just made so much more confidence and then for you guys, so just to leave you with this is that those people, oh I believe in what you say, I can't just keep they're out there. No matter what room you get into, no matter how hard you get blasted, no matter how big you get booed, no matter how much money gets dumped on your head, just just get up and smile and, and keep going because those people will always be there um, to support you even with a whisper. And uh, you never know where else. So if you ever want to run or if you ever want more information, you can find me at Rosemount High School. You can look me up. I'm pretty easy to get in contact with, so I'd be glad to answer any question and help move this movement forward. You guys take care and have a wonderful day.